My name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of our Beale Institute for Entrepreneurship, and I also uh, am an associate professor at the Weatherhead School of Management. Um, and it's, this is an exciting um, session for me on a number of levels today. I think, Justin, you are my first former student that we've had oh, wow. in our speaker series, although we do have Jose Diaz coming like in a couple weeks, so you beat him by a couple weeks. Good, good. Um, so it's great to it's great to reconnect, Justin. I had the privilege of having in class, and we knew each other a little bit before. And I'm thrilled right. to have him here today with us. Um, all of our sessions are student moderated, and it really gives me great pleasure to have Daryl Butler as our student moderator. Daryl also is, uh, I guess he's still a current student because he's got another semester left. But we um, were with each other in class this past semester, and he's working on a great. Um, entrepreneurship uh, related uh, internship this summer, which is which has really been fun to watch him um, flourish in. So I'm going to turn it over to Daryl in a second, who will moderate the conversation with Justin. If you're obviously on Zoom, you can use the chat um, uh, function to A, introduce yourself, share your LinkedIn profile, and B, let Daryl know if you have a question. You can either sort of raise your hand, put your question in the chat, and um, the best way to do it is for for uh, you just unmute and Daryl will call on you to, to share your question. If you're on LinkedIn Live, just put your question right in the comment box and uh, my colleague Doug DiGirolamo will be monitoring that as well. So I uh, look forward to spending the next hour with you and uh, Daryl and uh, Justin, thanks for doing this. And Daryl, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? You're good? Okay. So my name is Daryl Butler. I am a senior, senior history major at Case Western Reserve. And uh, today it is my pleasure to introduce to you a uh, distinguished alumni. Uh, so I've, I've done quite a bit of uh, reading about Justin and uh, he's such an interesting man. Uh, everything from corporate strategy to consulting to criminal justice reform to social justice. Um, he does quite a bit, and so he is now the Chief Strategy Officer at, am I saying that right, Chief Strategy Officer at Urban Nova, and they are a public-private organization who are working to design better cities. Mm -hmm. So without any further ado, if you guys would help me welcome Mr. Justin Bibb. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Daryl, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Professor Goldberg, uh, for, for having me. Uh, and I'm excited just to have a candid conversation about where we are in this moment right now in this country, what it means for cities, and how I believe entrepreneurship can be a tool uh, to make our cities more just and equitable. And so, as Daryl mentioned, you know, I just joined Urbanova about two months ago as Chief Strategy Officer, and we are a nonprofit uh, public-private partnership focused on helping mid-sized cities reimagine themselves and how they can leverage resident voice and urban technology to, to address issues related to health equity, economic development, uh, and public safety as it relates to impacting the built environment. You know, and, and our thesis is that mid-sized cities are uniquely positioned to be models of urban innovation across the country. And it's funny because uh, before COVID, uh, people would have thought, you know, this is a crazy assumption, right, that mid-sized cities can really be uh, these great models. But I think that given where we are in America right now, mid-sized cities, because of their size, uh, because of, of the ability to uh, test and innovate uh, and have rapid experimentation, uh, but also uh, we can, you know, pilot innovative ideas and concepts in a way where uh, you can get really good scale uh, and also show uh, other small and larger cities uh, best models of innovation. And so, you know, that's why we truly believe that mid-sized cities are uniquely positioned. And, you know, we also believe that, you know, when it comes to smart cities, it's a very nebulous term uh, for a lot of people. And uh, leaders in the tech sector for far too long have thought that technology is a panacea to our problems, right? You, but if you look at the pushback we've seen with sidewalk labs and them pulling out of Toronto, um, you know, that effort didn't uh, materialize in an effective way because residents weren't 
at the table. When you look at the, the issues that GE has had in San Diego with their streetlight program, again, just throwing technology at, at the issue can't be uh, effective or it can't be the way that we think about how to solve these vexing structural social justice issues. And so at Renova, we believe that you have to lead with the resident voice uh, to identify what are the core problems of a community. But also once you understand those core priorities, how do you develop actionable problem statements in plain language that the community can rally around? And from there, you identify what could be a tech-enabled solution. It could be a high, medium, or a low tech-enabled solution that could really solve those problems. And so uh, we think that you know the country is at a crossroads when it comes to the future of cities. And I've been, uh, as, as Michael mentioned before, I've been reading a lot about uh, these two debates, right? On one side of the debate, everyone says it's the death of cities. Uh, and on the other side of the debate, it says that this is a big moment for America to really reimagine uh, the role of cities in our country. And I fundamentally believe, um, you know, that COVID, uh, the pandemic of COVID, and the, the pandemic that we've had in this country for over 400 years of structural racism, you know, uh, creates an opportunity for all of us to really reimagine how we make our communities better and really enact big, bold change to do that. And so, um, you know, a lot of us thought that New York would, wouldn't come back after 9-11. Many thought that, you know, a city like Cleveland couldn't have a resurgence after all we've gone through here in my hometown. But, you know, I would, I'm willing to bet that you don't wanna bet against the American cities. And I believe that mid-sized cities like Cleveland are uniquely positioned to lead us to a new, a new day and a new era. And I'm looking forward to talking to you guys uh, throughout this afternoon about uh, some ways we can do that through entrepreneurship. Wonderful. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to, I want to, I'll start out with a question. And, yeah. uh, <clears throat> you know, since we're talking about mid sized cities and we are case people and uh, Clevelanders, many of us, um, can you, can you tell me more about what your hope is in Cleveland? What do you see where you can affect change and um, maybe see some results in the community that, you know, Cleveland definitely has its, its uh, areas that, that need help. And, and I think that Urban Nova is definitely angling to try and change those. Yeah, great question. You know, this is a, a pretty personal question for me because, you know, I was born and raised in the city. I grew up in Mount Pleasant in the southeast side of the city. And that's a neighborhood that has not seen any real uh, investment uh, in generations. Um, and, you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, you did, I didn't think it was that bad until I left and came back and saw the historic lack of investment. And when you think about the structural issues facing Cleveland, I mean, 50% of our children are living in poverty. 33% uh, of adults are, are, in, are living in poverty. We have a, a median household income of roughly $29,000 a year. Uh, Bloomberg just did a piece a couple of days ago about the inequities that we saw for small and medium-sized businesses on the east side of our city and their inability to get access to PPP loans. And so these are structural vexing issues that we've been dealing with in Cleveland for a long time. And I think that until we find a way to, not, number one, um, really dismantle the structural barriers that prevent people of color from accessing economic opportunity in terms of getting access to capital and having the right information in terms of how to grow and scale their business. I think secondly, we have to really reimagine our education system as a pipeline of economic opportunity. Uh, while you did a report uh, last year and it said that unemployed youth are costing our economy regionally about a billion dollars of lost economic productivity. And so, you know, we have to start encouraging uh, entrepreneurship early on uh, in the education development process. I see Eileen Frankel from uh, the uh, Youth Entrepreneurship Institute on the line. And I believe that, you know, kids should be working to start a business in middle school and high school because it gives them the skill sets to compete in a truly knowledge-based 21st century economy. And so I think we have to also think about uh, being more risk-oriented when it comes to public policy. Uh, you know, Michael and I talked a lot about this when I was a grad student at Case that, you know, our, our uh, our community in Cleveland is almost too risk averse, right? You know, if you're in Silicon Valley and you have a really, you know, awesome idea, 
you're encouraged to go to market. And if you fail, that's okay because you learn from that failure and you go back to market and you do a better job. And so I think changing the culture is probably the biggest thing we have to do in Cleveland to begin to address some of these structural issues that I believe uh, enable us to uh, achieve our long-term potential. That's great. <clears throat> and so Urban Nova is located, they're based in Spokane, Washington? Spokane, Washington, yeah. And that's kind of a mid-sized city itself, yeah? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I know there was a project with the streetlights. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I thought this was very interesting because I didn't think you would be able to get this kind of information out of this kind of technology. So yeah, can you yes. tell us a little more? So we worked with um, our partners uh, in Spokane uh, to deploy uh, streetlight um, sensors uh, across a historically disenfranchised neighborhood in Spokane. And in those sensors, we were able to detect uh, air quality of those neighborhoods. And by showing where we had um, inadequate air quality, we started to work with neighborhood-based organizations to come up with local strategies on how we address issues related to air quality and particularly uh, respiratory health. Uh, we just received a grant from NIH to continue to do that work at the neighborhood level. And then also through our work with Gallup in, uh, in Spokane, uh, we also looked at how do we start to really prioritize the built health in the built environment as a strategy to tackle some of these structural issues that are, that are occurring when it comes to um, access to health and access to uh, great well-being opportunities. And so right now we're in the process with the city of Spokane to really think about maybe building a smart park in that neighborhood to start to address some of these issues in terms of how we enhance the built environment because access to uh, a great places to, to walk or uh, enjoying a public park play a large role in ensuring that folks have access to fresh air and an opportunity to increase their uh, uh, personal well-being. And so we're trying to really tackle these issues in a, in a more nuanced and intentional way. And we believe that data and analytics can be uh, a new frame for us to really reimagine how to solve some of these problems. That's great. And so you just brought up something that <clears throat> I, it was actually a question I was going to ask you about. Um, about the data. And yeah. I know one of the mission statements of Urban Nova um, is it's gathering data to, to help make sort of informed decisions. And sometimes that always sounds like real, you know, utopian. Yeah. Uh, you know, so can you tell us more about what kind of data you guys collect and how it's used and, and used for good? Obviously, yeah. this data can be used for bad purposes. I think people would like to know more about how that's yeah, creating a positive outcome. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, prior to coming to Urban Nova, I spent five years of my career at Gallup. Uh, and the founder of Gallup has this great quote that I love. He says that, you know, if, if, if democracy is about the will of the people, then it's our job to find out what that will is. And when it comes to public policy at the local level, generally the loudest voice gets the most attention, right? So that activist resident who's showing up to that city council meeting every week saying, you know, not in my backyard or, you know, I want to advocate for this policy. And sometimes, you know, that activism is good, but sometimes it, it doesn't have the, the nuance we need to truly understand what are the priorities of residents at the local level. And so when I was at Gallup, you know, we worked with Renova to build uh, a, a neighborhood-based survey to really understand what were the pain points and priorities of residents uh, in one of the most disenfranchised neighborhoods in Spokane. And it was that analysis and that data that gave us this perspective on how we wanna measure addressing air quality and improving the built environment to address well-being uh, across the city of Spokane. And it's that same model that, you know, we, I helped deploy in Tulsa with the mayor of Tulsa, Mayor G.T. Bynum. We created what, what they call the City Voice Index. And the mayor of, of Tulsa ran a great campaign focused on data and analytics, and he wanted to have a new way of measuring a thriving city. And so the question that he asked is this famous Gallup question. The question asked, uh, imagine yourself in your life today uh, on a ladder with 10 rings. Um, how do you see yourself? 
Are you thriving, struggling, and suffering? Now you ask that same question, how do you see yourself five years from now, right? And so that, that delta in terms of where you see yourself now versus 10 years from now gives you a perspective on what are truly the lived experiences of residents at the local level. Um, and it's that level of how you measure thriving, struggling, and suffering that I think uh, helps you have better data-driven public policy because you're truly capturing the lived experiences of residents uh, in terms of how you think about public policy at the local level. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I also saw, <clears throat> I guess, something similar happened in Arizona. You, uh, yeah. 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 And so I thought that was very interesting because there was a, a basically the statement was, is that you needed to get more information from the citizens, mm -hmm. but there was no like database. There was no one asking, there was nowhere that these opinions were kept and so that people can make informed decisions about what the constituents want. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, research out there. Um, I would encourage folks to look at, you know, Danny Kahneman, Angus Deaton are all uh, experts in uh, behavioral economics and the behavioral economics of place. and you know, I believe that, you know, the classical economic indicators of GDP and per capita income are sometimes not the best uh, proxies of how you truly measure a thriving city. But if you're able to get, you know, more data on what's the true lived experience of my grandma, who's 91, who's still in Mount Pleasant in the, in, in the, in the house I grew up in, and how she views her daily life living in, in, in the city in terms of accessing transit, accessing her grocery store or what her walk to church is on a weekly basis, her experience is going to be very different than, you know, uh, Daryl, who, who wants to come to Cleveland and, and start a business and how he interacts with institutions is also very different. And it's the understanding that nuance that enable us to have more people centered approaches to public policy that I think are missing in a lot of cities right now. Yeah. Okay, we have a uh, panel question for you. Yeah. Uh, this is from Elizabeth, Elizabeth Children. And the question is, what are the current and anticipated growth areas in Cleveland or Spokane? And she's particularly curious about healthcare and medical tech. Mm, great, great question. Um, you know, I think healthcare will continue to be a, uh, a growth driver for uh, Cleveland, um, uh, especially if we continue to see uh, a shift in uh, telehealth um, and uh, a greater importance around data and analytics inside the healthcare sector. I also believe that COVID has presented uh, a unique opportunity for more onshoring uh, in terms of how we look at our global supply chains. And in the manufacturing and advanced manufacturing sector, uh, I think Cleveland is well positioned uh, to take advantage of that. And so um, but I also think that one of the, the biggest opportunities we have right now is there's a lot of homegrown talent in our underserved neighborhoods. I like to say we have a lot of young Einsteins walking around our city that we've yet to invest in, and they have some of the best ideas that can really bring our city back. And we need to find a way to systematically build bridges of opportunity to ensure that those young Einsteins can be a part of the next chapter of America's, of, of Cleveland's economic growth story. Thank you. Okay, so for another question, I have another uh, question that, that I was thinking about. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, the public to private partnerships, yeah. the importance of those and, um, and, and how you think that they can affect change in the cities that, that we're talking about? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we're seeing in, in my role over Nova is we have, uh, three major awesome partners, Verizon, Avista, and iTron. And, you know, those partners are all trying to find ways to sell their technology and products inside of cities like Spokane or Tulsa or Tampa or Cleveland. And one of the things that, you know, we're able to do is because we're a nonprofit and because that we, you know, have a better understanding of the, the pain points of various neighborhoods and cities, we can go in as a uh, intermediary third party to test some of the new technology that our partners want to test at the local level. Uh, we also need to engage uh, our research partners in the university sector to see how do we advance some of the science that we're looking to test as well. And so 
I think it's this hybrid of being able to convene the public and the private uh, and the university sector into the city space to really test these ideas around innovation uh, that make the public-private model, I think, uh, a, a great framework for how cities try to think about how to better use urban technology and smart cities tech to improve the lived experience of residents. Um, I was just reiterating again, we do have so many young Einsteins in the community. I mean, I feel like I'm one of them, but I also want to serve as a mentor for those within the community that don't have mentors, right? So um, in this vein, you kind of mentioned that you issued a survey for disenfranchised communities to determine how they were best served. Mm -hmm. So in this process, how did you gather this information? What elements did you include in your survey? And mm -hmm. then what were your uh, primary results to garner support from the community? Great question. So the first thing that we did was we conducted uh, stakeholder interviews through a cross section of community leaders uh, in Spokane. Uh, and that way we were able to get kind of the good context of what was going on in the city. After that, uh, we used the information from our stakeholder interviews to conduct focus groups uh, with residents in the neighborhood we wanted to do the survey in. And in those focus group conversations, we were able to identify what were the core pain points of the East Central neighborhood where we were doing our survey. And then from there, we worked with Gallup to create custom questions around air quality, homelessness, um, food security, housing security, economic development. Uh, and then, you know, we had some custom questions on those issues, but also we worked with Gallup to look at their battery of questions that they've been using for uh, decades uh, across the world to ensure that we had some scientifically validated uh, questions to use in our survey. And then from there, we kind of took all that together and developed our custom survey instrument for uh, the Spokane neighborhood. And we use, Gallup uses a similar process uh, in Tulsa, where the mayor convened a, a cross section of leaders from across City Hall and the city at large, from the fire department, police department, uh, the, the foundation sector, et cetera, to identify what were the core pain points of Tulsa and how, do those, how can we translate those pain points into actionable questions to ask residents. And so that's essentially the process that we uh, developed in it's been used um, uh, for years in terms of uh, really good ways to get to get to gauge resident voice at the local level. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, did you have a question you wanted to put out? Sure. This is fun. I get to be on the other side. Usually it was just an ask. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, you know, I'd love um, to talk a little bit about the role of government um, mm -hmm. in supporting entrepreneurship, and particularly in this moment. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, and I know you're very close to kind of this, you know, some of the efforts at the state of Ohio level administered through organizations like Jumpstart that are traditionally focused on tech-based high growth entrepreneurship. Um, and I think that there's an acknowledgement, I think Jumpstart would acknowledge it as well, that that you know, focus on the next Google or the next sort of high growth tech based company may leave a lot of folks out. And, uh, you know, at this moment, which a, you know, the economy is, is reeling and, and, um, and changing in many ways and B, you know, as you alluded to discussions around equity and social justice. And I think the piece that you wrote for the plane dealer was really thought provoking, you know, I'm sort of curious, in, in a world in which we need our political leaders to be entrepreneurial and we need government to be entrepreneurial, as well as donors in the private sector, um, what are some of the things that you'd like to see happen right now to kind of address um, you know, the, the crises on, on many levels? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, it's something I think about a lot. You know, I don't believe in big government or small government. I believe in smart government. And I think we're at a moment now where the problems are so vexing and nuanced and interdisciplinary that local government can't solve all these problems together by themselves. And we, you know, I believe Washington or Columbus isn't going to come save Cleveland. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to really reimagine the role of, of local government, particularly in Cleveland, to create the right conditions for innovation. I'll give you an example. Um, yeah, I just did a focus group with some 
small business owners in the Mount Pleasant and the Miles neighborhood. And I was just, you know, so alarmed that many of them don't have digital identities to create a Facebook profile where they can, you know, tell their customers to come here and shop or eat or, you know, or dine with us, um, you know, as they try to come and recover from COVID. Um, it's those basic fundamentals that a lot of these businesses are lacking. I mean, many of them didn't even know uh, that they could apply for PPP or apply for loans from the city or the county. So there's these massive information gaps that exist. And so I think that in that instance, how can uh, local government uh, empower uh, neighborhood volunteers or young students from CASE who are experts in creating Facebook or Instagram accounts or Yelp pages and work with them to partner with those businesses to create digital identity so they can uh, you know, enter into an e-commerce uh, society and world when it comes to engaging in the marketplace. And so I think it's those types of examples where I think local government can partner intentionally in a very direct, direct way to address some of these structural gaps that exist in, in terms of how we help small businesses thrive across the city. Thanks, Justin Gray. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so we have another panel question, but I really quick want to just make a correction that the question earlier was from Julie Renneker regarding um, Cleveland and Spokane and healthcare and medical tech. So just wanted to clear that up. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, Soria, would you like to uh, unmute and you can ask Justin your question, please? Um, sure. So my question was, uh, this was the first time I'm actually hearing about smart cities. So I wanted to know if you guys experienced, your organization experienced the first mover advantage in that field. And if you guys didn't experience that, how have you been dealing with competition? That, that's a great question. It's my day job uh, to think about this every day. I would say, um, you know, the smart city sector is a nebulous, still ever evolving industry, I believe. You know, my CEO would like to say it's not even a sector yet. And I tend to agree with that. I, you know, I think that in the early 2000s, you saw organizations like IBM, um, try to really, you know, take advantage of their technological expertise and, and really take advantage of being a first mover in the space. And then you saw uh, a company like Sidewalk Labs that's funded by Google and their efforts to be the go-to urban innovation, smart cities player in the market. But what you're seeing now is that there's this tech clash, right, where you know, residents don't want their data in the cloud owned by the Amazons or the IBMs or the Googles of the world. Um, and a lot of residents don't know how this technology truly impacts them on a daily basis because they're not a part of the conversation. And so I think given that what we're seeing in, with the tech clash of the sidewalk labs and the GEs of the world, there's a unique opportunity for uh, a nimble startup nonprofit like Urbanova to really show that if you lead with resident voice, if you're intentional about how you drive collaboration, and if you work on tangible problems that are informed by folks at the neighborhood level, then you can start to think about best ways to test, deploy, and implement smart cities, urban tech solutions at the local level. And so I think COVID is creating an opportunity for uh, my firm to be a first mover in that space. And I'm optimistic because of the work that we're doing now that we'll be able to do that uh, in the future. Thank you. Okay, next we have a question from Mark, if you would like to unmute and ask Justin. Hi, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about your plans for smart parks as well as the financial restrictions for those relative to the normal parks or if we would change the existing parks to qualify as smart parks or how would that work? Great question. Um, you know, the word smart park might seem like a very ambitious, uh, high tech uh, effort. Um, but you know, how we're thinking about it is, think about a park in, your, in, a, in a local neighborhood. And let's say that park currently is experiencing uh, a lot of drug activity uh, or a lot of crime, right? Um, if you restructured that park where you had more grass, 
more lighting during certain times of day um, and, you know, more engaged residents to activate programming on that park, then, you know, I would define that to be a smart park, right? Um, and so basically, you know, you create a modular park where you can change the, the aesthetics of the park in a more dynamic way versus you have a park now, lights come on at a certain time, <laughs> lights go off at a certain time, there's really any programming to really engage the neighborhood. And so that's how we're looking at, that's how we're thinking about a smart park. I mean, even deploying Wi-Fi in our existing public park. So folks can come in the summer to work, play, et cetera, right? So it's that type of investment we're looking at in terms of how you build more equitable uh, parks with technology being an enabler to make them smarter, more efficient, uh, and more resilient for the, the residents who wanna use that, that public park uh, with, inside of a city context. Thank you. All right, so our next question from the panel is from Eileen Frankel. If you can go ahead and ask Justin. Hi, Justin, how are you? Good to see you, it's been a long time. It has. Nice to see you as well. So for those of you who don't know me, I am from Young Entrepreneur Institute. We work with teachers and students in grades K to 12 to um, get them interested in entrepreneurship, to give entrepreneurial experiences, and to just promote excitement about giving entrepreneurship a try. And my question for you is, how do we capitalize on this moment in time? Mm -hmm. We want to engage kids, take their ideas and their passion for change and social entrepreneurship, social justice, and combine it with entrepreneurship and think about it in an entrepreneurial way, not just in a march, but how can, um, how can changes be made in a bigger and more long-term way? And we're starting to think about how to get kids involved, but I'm curious as to what your advice would be. Great, great question. Uh, I think the first thing is um, having candid, intentional conversations, uh, particularly you know, if you're trying to engage students from a majority white population, who may not have had the exposure or awareness about what's happening in our country right now. And without that awareness and education, it's gonna be hard to go deep uh, in terms of how you really start addressing some of these structural issues. So maybe, you know, why, you know, your organization can implement the 1619 project curriculum uh, as part of a, a, a way to engage them first in the historical context of where we are right now, and then what's the role of entrepreneurship to address those issues? I mean, one example could be, you know, when I came back from Cleveland about six years ago, from New York about six years ago, we did a criminal justice hackathon where we brought together uh, technologists, coders, activists, folks in business, folks in public policy and said, look, you know, we want to march, we want to protest, but is there a way to use civic technology as a way to reimagine how to solve some of these problems? And that has entrepreneurship and design uh, all the way through it. And so that could be one example of a way to actively engage uh, our young uh, entrepreneurs in, in, in this work. So, uh, you know, I would encourage awareness, education, and then using some of the technology models to um, brainstorm and pressure test best ways to hack new solutions to solve some of these issues that uh, we're trying to solve. Okay, I like that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see here, looking for questions. Uh, yeah, Michael, do you have another one for a moment? No, I was yeah. gonna invite, you know, we could put some, I could do cold calling like, like my old <laughs> I'll, I'll get nightmares from law school if you start doing that, Michael. Let me, let me, <laughs> do, jump, let me do jump in. Um, oh, actually Bridget just said she was, had a question. So Bridget, I'll you can spare mine and why don't you jump in and unmute yourself and ask Justin the question. Yeah. Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm also actually from Spokane, Washington. Um, nice. I, uh, my dad worked with Amber Waldorf from River Nova for a while oh, on the nice. council. So awesome. yeah. And I got to I know Heather Rose the trader a little bit. So anyways, very excited to hear from you and all about your work. Um, but my kind of question is when it comes to entrepreneurship, uh, even like social entrepreneurship, like this is really interesting um, and inspiring for a lot of young people. How do you kind of separate or bring together people who kind of view entrepreneurship more through the lens of profits and kind of the Silicon Valley startup culture, um, which has those benefits of kind of being more, less risk averse that like you talked about, but kind of combine people who really want to make change with entrepreneurship uh, and people who are kind of more interested in the profit side of that? 
you know, that's a great question. Um, I think you have to make the case for the double bottom line. Um, and I think that you have to uh, really lead with the, you know, your, your framework on, we want to solve a problem. There could be a profit opportunity, but really the profit opportunities in our motive, our motive is to come up with a compelling idea to disrupt uh, a vexing social issue. And so I think it really depends on how you frame it, how you frame it, how you communicate it, and how you measure success uh, to ensure that you can try to weave those threads a little bit. Um, and I also think that entrepreneurship will always be um, defined uh, in a way that resonates with an individual, right? So how I define it and view it might be different than how Michael defines it, right? And so I think it's when you're building your team to address this issue as a social entrepreneur, it's about making sure that your team is aligned and engaged and on the same page as you plan your strategy. And so those would be some of the tactics I would deploy if I were uh, in your position. Thank you. Okay, we have another panel question from Graham. Hello. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about Urbanova um, in regards to what parts of the problem solving process mm -hmm. that you guys are part of and then you know the whole process to widespread implementation across multiple cities um, you know where do you pick up that project and where do you kind of pass it off to a government agency mm -hmm. or the private sector um, because I know you guys are very data driven yeah I wasn't sure if you know like your focus is first the research and the data and then you pass it off or you know just could you elaborate on that yeah, and I think this is an area that we're still proving out, to be honest with you, Graham. Um, but I can tell you what we're learning. What, what we're learning is, you know, we're really good at, with our partners at Gallup and other university partners, that the research and the data and good research framework and a research design process to develop a, a best in class pilot. I think where there's opportunity in the market where we see a position for us is designing those pilot interventions in conjunction with city uh, and industry partners as well, right? So let's take the, the example of affordable housing. Let's say that through our research and data collection process, we identify access to affordable housing and in income security as a major problem, right? So how can we work with the housing authority uh, and the local energy utility and uh, the city to design a, an affordable housing pilot to address uh, you know, energy costs because if your gas bill keeps going up and you can't predict that, then you can't stay in, in, in your home, right? And so it's, it's trying to triangulate um, these types of pilot programs and bringing these partners together uh, in, a, in a safe space to test, ideate, and brainstorm that we think we can help do a better job of creating more effective pilots because when you look at the market, a lot of mayors and CIOs of local governments are just sick and tired of, you know, the, the Googles, the Amazons, IBMs of the world trying to sell them on great pilots, but nothing is, you can't really measure success, right? And then they, you go away and that, that's it. There's no real proof of concept. So we believe that setting up these innovation test beds at the local level and being that partner that brings these folks together could be a great way to have more research informed pilots that can get long-term buy-in from city government so that those projects are sustainable in the long run. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. I believe we're gonna pass it back to Michael Goldberg. I think he has another question. Sure. Um, so, as you know, I have, I have a new job on campus um, working with this deal institute. And I'm sort of curious from your perspective as an alum, as somebody yeah. with deep Cuban ties, and you look back at your alma mater of, uh, of Case Western Reserve, what can we be doing better in the community? How can, um, you know, I think at this moment that every institution I mean, we've got our own challenges as higher ed is going through the crisis, but I'm sort of curious what, from your perspective, we could do better, as, particularly as it relates to entrepreneurship. You know, um, this is something that I, I thought a lot about during my time at Case. Uh, I was there for four years for the JD MBA program. And 
while I thought that Case did, you know, was engaged in the community and, and had, we have very robust community programs, like in our dental school, our med school, uh, at our social work school, et cetera, I still think there is this perception that Case is an ivory tower, ivory tower and a very, very um, historic, uh, you know, economically distressed neighborhood. Um, and I don't believe that Case has done enough uh, to open up um, the wealth of resources and opportunities we might have for folks living in Glenville and in Huff and in East Cleveland. And I think that if we're honest about where we are, I think that's a, that's, that's a problem that most institutions in this town have done a terrible job with. You know, the art museum, the orchestra, you name it. You know, most of our institutions have really been bad at being intentional about community engagement. It's a nice buzzword, it looks good in an annual report, but what does that intentionality look like? And so when I think about entrepreneurship, it's, you know, can we, you know, raise capital through cases network to actually, you know, um, invest in black owned businesses in Glenville and Huff to make sure they're thriving in, in a new economy? Can we, you know, start to think through how to get our curriculum inside of our local schools that are in cases footprint so that, you know, students and CMSD have access to the resources early on? You know, what's the minority spin, uh, the spin of, of, of business that we're doing at Case with minority owned businesses and thinking through the supply chain of how Case spends its dollars and can Case use its purchasing power to invest in those neighborhoods inside inside the, the local neighbor community. And so it's those things that I think we should be thinking about in terms of Case doing a better job of engaging those neighborhoods and communities. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like we have two more panel questions, which may may take us up to the bell there. So, uh, Mr. Adam King, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Justin, can you speak to any issues, if there are any, about creating smart solutions mm -hmm. for institutions and organizations that don't traditionally deal with equity or are averse to equity traditionally? Yeah, Adam, I, I think you're, I think I'm getting, the premise of your question, I, I agree with, right? I think that it's going to be impossible for any institution, particularly in Cleveland, to try to use smart or smart cities technology as a vehicle to address some of these issues without meeting people where they are. And without that resident voice, resident engagement framework up front, uh, then whatever solution you design will be flawed uh, and not sustainable. And so I think it goes back to this notion of you got to meet people where they are. You got to ensure that residents are a part of the entire development of whatever solution you come up with. And you also have to ensure that they have a vested interest and a vested stake in what you're doing. And so when you think about this idea of building a smart park, you know, you have to do it in a way that you're empowering the residents and giving residents agency in the process to make it theirs. Uh, and essentially, you're just essentially building the, the environment in the right conditions to get that done. And so I agree with your premise, and I think you know you and I are on the same page when it comes to how to best engage these communities in an intentional way. Real quick follow up: Are you going to run for mayor anytime soon? <laughs> it's something I'm thinking about, but we'll see. <laughs> Campaign manager. <laughs> I think you should. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so uh, Marissa Katz is. As our next question, if you are available, Marissa, if not, I'll ask it. I'm, I'm here. Okay. Um, so I know earlier you were talking about working with the local governments and really more like the individuals who live in the city because that's the individuals are really where we learn about these like core issues. And there's so many different social issues that will arise in any situation. So my question is more of how do you kind of select and prioritize which ones to take on first because there's undoubtedly going to be resource limitations? That's a great question. I think you gotta lead with the data. Um, uh, if you look at Cleveland, I think that you've seen uh, this historic disinvestment, particularly in the east side. Uh, there are also pockets on the west side that have yet to see any real investment, particularly in the Hispanic community. Uh, but, you know, I think that for Cleveland to truly live up to its true potential, we've got to have a Marshall Plan to restore the black middle class 
on the east side of the city. Uh, and we have a historic opportunity to make that big, bold investment in case now, given where the world is, is moving, um, and given the fact that, you know, that those neighborhoods have yet to see catalytic investment in a long time. Uh, and there's a case to be made because, you know, there is uh, uh, tons of opportunity that we've yet to tap into. And so you have to lead with the data. You have to be intentional about how you think about your resources. But if it were me, that's where I would uh, prioritize my, my effort. Thank you. So we have a couple more. I think we can probably sneak these in. Uh, Larry Clay, are you available? Yeah. Um, I had a question for Justin about uh, has he or his organization participated in um, any whole systems uh, strategies, such as uh, the appreciative inquiry workshops, uh, similar to what's been going on uh, for the past, I think, 10, 20 years, sustainable Cleveland movement, uh, the initiative by the mayor. Um, have you ever, have you experienced that or been a part of that? Then the second part of my question is, uh, what strategies have been implemented to engage in communities that have traditionally been excluded, disenfranchised, and disengaged? Uh, because one of the problems that I've, I've been seeing, because this, I am a researcher in city dynamics and mm -hmm. inclusive innovation, um, a lot of times things are created and it, the access is one of the one of the barriers, especially uh, once you get to, as they call the base of the pyramid, the bottom, mm -hmm. the people that are, you know, the low hanging fruit, so to speak. And as I heard before, there are opportunities of engaging with those Einsteins to, to cultivate them. And um, just wondering what are some of the things that have, that have been traditionally tried and are there things that you guys are um, experimenting with in the future? Yeah, thanks, Larry, for the question. You know, I'd say uh, I've, I haven't participated in Sustainable Cleveland. I was one of the co-chairs of Cleveland Rising, uh, which used the AI framework to gather community and feedback on where we are uh, as a city and region. Uh, and, you know, overall, I think that was a successful process. Uh, COVID has made us kind of re reassess where we go next. Uh, but I thought it was a, a really good convening to get diverse feedback and input on where we need to go as a community. I think to your second question, I would just point you to a couple of resources. I think the first resource would be uh, to look at the work of uh, Mordecai Cargill and Evelyn Burnett at Third Space a Action Lab, which is right uh, in Glenville, uh, in, in, in Case's backyard. And they're doing some amazing work organizing communities uh, to address some of these structural issues that we're dealing with in Cleveland when it comes to race uh, and equity. Um, you know, they've been leading this effort for over the last couple of years of engaging leaders from the private and public sector uh, through um, the REI, Racial Equity Institute training, which I think has helped to start a new conversation about what, what is the cost of systematic exclusion of people of color in the city and what do we need to do to, to eradicate these issues uh, moving forward. Uh, I think also uh, the work of Neighborhood Connections. I mean, they do some amazing work at the grassroots level. Uh, to engage everyday heroes and sheroes in our city uh, that are doing the hard work, uh, making sure we have thriving neighborhoods. And so I will look at those two groups to see what they're doing as a good model for uh, your work at Case. Thank you. And we have one last question. We'll um, ask it because this is actually always very relevant. And it is, please forgive me if I mispronounce, is it Ceylon? It's Ceylon. Yeah. My apologies. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I just had a, had a question about uh, what does community engagement look like after COVID? Great question. Um, and I, I want to I don't I want to frame this in a more of a national uh, context. You know, one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, one of my heroes in business, Ken Chenault. He says that the role of a leader is to define reality and give hope. And in this current media environment we're in right now, um, you saw different models of leaders at every level of government talking about the issues and the problems that we're having as related to COVID. You know, what's real news, what's not fake news. And I think that for me, community engagement is, you know, leadership uh, that prioritizes bottom-up engagement 
just as we prioritize top-down engagement. It's leadership that prioritizes facts and data, regardless of the political consequences for our own uh, political um, uh, advantage. And then lastly, it's uh, engagement that does not negate people's lived experience. Uh, and you know, when you think about the pandemic of structural racism, you know, I don't think America would be having this conversation about structural racism if we didn't have uh, COVID because there were no distractions. There was no baseball to be distracted by. There was no concert to be distracted by. There was no grand opening at the movie theater to be distracted by. Everybody in this country had to look on that television and see that cop's knee on George Floyd's neck. We couldn't, you couldn't turn away from it. And until we really uh, do the hard work of understanding that we're all different, that our, our experience in this country is not, not, not the same, and we bring that, that awareness and that level of, of, of context and nuance to the table, then I don't think we'll see any real change. And so that's how I would define community engagement uh, for post-COVID and a post um, uh, and, and, and in this moment as we try to identify where we go from here as we think about our social justice journey as, as a nation. Thank you, Justin. Also, just want to thank you for an outstanding conversation. Uh, I learned quite a bit. And uh, thank you for the, to the panel for the outstanding questions. I'm going to pass it back to Michael Goldberg. Okay. Well, thank you for moderating. Um, among the many skills you're picking up in your Case Western Reserve journey, you can chalk up successful panel moderation. Great job. Um, and keep up the great work this summer. Um, Justin, it's great. I mean, we obviously look forward to having you back on campus when we're all not social distancing. Um, we're really proud of the work that you're doing in the city. Um, it's been fun to watch uh, your journey and, and the things that you might do in the future you are doing and your contribution. I know I'm, I'm really enjoying working with you on the Cleveland Foundation strategic yeah. planning committee. And yeah. um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join our alumni speaker series today. Thank you for having me. Great to be with you.